Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here and an honor also to be among so many museum practitioners and uh, documentation professionals and present the user's view on digital data. Uh, I'm a sociologist um, at the Latvian Academy of Culture. And today, and also uh, my, my, my main interest is in the memory, in memory studies. And today I'm going to tell you about the project that I did. Uh, it was a postdoctoral project uh, where I worked uh, with three national uh, digital museum databases, Latvian NMKK, Finnish Finna, and Estonian MUIS, uh, and used uh, these data to, to study memory. And um, I'll tell you a little bit uh, why, what, what I was looking for, a bit about challenges that I faced in the process and also about the uh, exciting new way for me to explore the data that I didn't know is there, actually. So, but before I go to the actual data, I will um, briefly introduce the theoretical concepts because as a sociologist, memory scholar, that's what I'm studying. So. Uh, this, uh, this first concept is mnemonic de density, and, um, and it's basically about the central thesis of memory studies that our, the past that we remember or commemorate, it's, it's selective. We don't remember everything, we don't, uh, don't uh, collect, collect everything. Uh, we, uh, some, some, uh, some things, some events, some persons, some periods are more important to us, and some are simply ignored. And uh, mnemonic density is Aviatar Zerubovel's concept uh, that simply refers to diverse intensity with which we remember different historical periods, like years, decades, and, and centuries. And, um, and for sociologists, it's, uh, it's interesting because it tells about our present-day society. What's important to us, if we look what past we remember, we can tell about our uh, political priorities and about uh, present-day society. And Eviatar um, studied this. Uh, there are two examples. Uh, he, for example, uh, on the left side, uh, it's, um, he counted uh, uh, history textbook pages ded dedicated to, to specific decades. This is American history textbooks. And he, this shows like a mnemonic, diverse mnemonic density of, of uh, remembered time. And on the right side, uh, these are, um, um, it's a diagram of uh, official celebrations, official uh, celebration days in uh, official calendars that are dedicated, usually they refer back to some historical uh, events. And these are, it's like too tiny to see, but the idea is the, the, the top one is Thailand, the, the, the bottom one is Burkina Faso, how, how we uh, mark in our, in our uh, uh, differently, different uh, historical periods, and um, and in my uh, in my mind, it could be applied also not only to historical periods, but it can be applied also to different uh, other properties of the past, like different geograph geographies or different materialities and collectivities. And uh, the other concept is. Um, theoretical kind of conceptualization is uh, the distinction between functional and storage memory, which is Aleides and Jan Asman's concept. And basically is that um, uh, it refers, refers back to the selective, selectiveness of, of a memory that we, uh, we operate or we use only a small part of the past, uh, which is meaningful to us today. Uh, and it's very selective. It's uh, what's, uh, what's, uh, what we can use today, what's, what talks to us, and it's called functional memory. And, um, and, in, and in, muse in a museum, that would be the exhibition part. It would be the, 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 the part of the collection that reaches uh, the audience. And also in other, uh, other mediums, it would be like a, uh, references to the past that are made in monuments, in history books. So this is a tiny part of the past that has happened. 
But then there is also storage memory, and this is where museums are central players, as well as archives and libraries. This is the past collected that, uh, that forms that are in storages of these uh, memory institutions. And in museum, it's a, it's, a, it's a huge storage. And in one of those uh, earlier presentations on the first day, there was this um, <clears throat> remark that only about 5% of all the collections of museum reaches are ever seen by the public. The rest is the storage. And, um, and sociologi sociologically, uh, storage is very important because um, it's uh, Asman's, uh, Asman's conceptualization that it provides a reservoir for alternative stories. If the functional memory uh, is, the, is, politically, is political, it uh, kind of reflects our current political interests, what's, what's useful. Uh, then um, in, de in democratic societies, uh, the, the storage provides alternative stories. Their researchers or museum practitioners can, can, go, can go in, pull out something, and challenge the existing pol uh, political stories. So it's very important. And um, it provides alternatives, contradictions, criticism, and remember incidents that enable change. And, uh, and uh, no wonder that in totalitarian societies, uh, this is uh, what, what, what the power does. It kind of censors the storages and uh, get rid of all those un uneasy parts and unfitting parts. Okay. Um, if uh, typically memory studies uh, uh, study functional part of memory because it's, it's accessible. You can uh, go read media stories, you can go to museum exhibitions and analyze what's there and what's not there. Storage is, uh, so far has been inaccessible for sociological inquiry because they are uh, institutional, they are kept separate in, uh, in separate physical locations, and they are documented in inventory books. But digital data, uh, it's uh, allows digitization of, of, of uh, collections, allows to look into storages. And for sociologists of memory, it's super exciting. Because now you can see not only the functional part, what is used, but you can see the reservoir. So you can see the potential, pot potentiality of what, has, what can be told about the past. And I uh, tried to kind of... Uh, overview or explore. So what, what is this, these reservoirs of three uh, national collections, um, Finnish, Finnam, Latvian, NMK, and Estonian Muis. And uh, as you can see, and as you well know, it contains a lot of data. And, um, and a, a beauty of, of uh, digital is that you can, if in sociological inquiry, inquiry we typically um, we typically work with samples. You, let's say you, take a, you have a whole population of people, you can't inquire all of their experiences, you take a sample of 100 people, you interview them, and then you extrapolate to the whole population, say this is the fact, like this is how it is. Then digital data allows to do the big data analysis. You actually can take the full, full data corpus but uh, that was my kind of intention at the beginning. But then you realize that it's too big, <laughs> anyway, for my computational capacities to overview. And also because I was exploring the data, I, w I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do at the beginning. So I narrowed down a bit, and I did um, analysis of data only on physical objects from the three databases. And the bottom part is the number of those objects. Yeah. And I analyzed, I tried to, my, my, my purpose was to overview, to see, and first of all, uh, the time, like those time densities, uh, also to explore other properties of objects that I can kind of overview, and material was one of them. And then I discovered in the process that you can explore an overview not only using metadata, but also using images, and I will share it at the later part of the presentation. But first on time, what I did, uh, what this represents basically is the number of objects informing about the specific um, uh, year. 
And uh, there are objects in all three databases, there are objects dating back to the 7,000 uh, years before Christian era to nowadays. And as you can see, uh, not surprising that uh, most of the objects are from the Christian era. And if you zoom in, this is kind of the uh, mnemonic uh, density, or also Zerubbabel calls it a mnemonic topography, where there are memory mountains and memory valleys. Uh, this is a mnemonic topography of all the three, uh, uh, three uh, nations the Finnish, Estonian, and Latvian. And this is uh, 18th century, 19th century, 20th century, and this, uh, these indicate how many objects are from, from that time. Um, as you can see, uh, there's the overall shape is kind of similar with the, with the most objects coming from the mid-20th century. But I think, uh, and also I, I won't go into like details what, what that means, but one interesting, uh, one interesting thing is there is a Estonian and Latvian data has this valley right after, you can't see the bottom, but it's right after World War II. So Finnish uh, data doesn't have that, it's kind of smooth, and there is this gap where there, we have much less objects and Estonians, which is kind of interesting. Um, the challenges. Uh, I was thinking, uh, when I started doing this, I was thinking that this, this will be kind of very straightforward. You just get the year of the objects, you aggregate, and you, uh, and you just calculate. And then I realized, and this is actually uh, more from Latvian data, and Latvian data really had this problem, that it turned out the dates are, are remarked by texts, which was, for me was like complete... Uh, surprise. Uh, so the same year could be could be uh, noted as all those kind of variations, and this of course made the computation of an aggregation uh, very difficult. But then I realized that also what's what's been done there is uh, the date field. It uh, informs us not only about the date but also about uncertainty of the date which kind of contains two pieces of information. Because many objects are not, it's not clear that they are from that or that date. There's this, it's around this time, or it's from the beginning, and it's from the end. So, uh, which makes sense for a human understanding of the, of, the, of the object, but which makes difficult to automate the process and use the computer. But I recoded Latvian data, and, uh, and so, some of Estonian and Finnish was pretty clean. Uh, so uh, kind of, I was very proud that I managed to do it, and uh, draw those diagrams at the end. Uh, material, just briefly. Another visualization uh, that I realized that I can do, uh, an overview, the storage, how it looks like from a material perspective. Uh, just Estonian and Latvian. Here my challenge was the language because materials are, are uh, marked in, um, in specific language, like in Estonian and Finnish. So I learned Estonian and Finnish uh, types of wood. For a while, I knew the terminology. <laughs> I have forgotten already. But these are visualizations of uh, Estonian and Latvian. They, they look uh, kind of similar, but actually they, uh, they are different because Estonian, uh, in Estonian data, materials are, they have the standard, a standard classification of materials, and there are tags for each. So each object are tagged with many materials, and what I calculated is all tags, and this is proportion from all tags of that material. Whereas in Latvian data, it's, uh, each object has a text field with, uh, with um, materials, with commas, and I recorded it to the primary material, so these are objects, actually. So it's, a, it's an illusion that it's similar. It's actually two different things. But, um, but uh, yeah, but it gives you impression of the storage. And finally, this is a, it looks super complicated, and, uh, uh, and actually, uh, for those who know about machine learning, it uh, probably makes more sense uh, than for those who haven't seen it, and I will just briefly um, try to explain how it works. So I, I realized um, that you can also explore 
uh, the, the data using just images without metadata, using uh, image recognition machine learning algorithm. And, um, and it's open source, so you can, uh, whoever wants to, to, to use it, uh, you can, uh, it's ready, ready made. And uh, how it works, it's, uh, it's an algorithm that has been trained on, um, on ImageNet. ImageNet is a huge database of contemporary images. And the algorithm has, uh, uh, what it does, it can um, take an image and classify it uh, in uh, thousand classes, which is uh, it's called WordNet. But basically, uh, it, uh, it works very, very good on uh, contemporary images. So it recognizes, for example, 20 species of dogs, uh, because that's what people put on the internet. But it doesn't recognize uh, historical objects, because it has been trained really on the contemporary world of images. And what I did, uh, there was no point in uh, classifying historical images from, from museums to those classes, because there were no classes for historical objects. But uh, what I did, I kind of cut off the later end of the algorithm and uh, used the algorithm to plot images by similarity. It's, it's, it's uh, by their kind of similar, semantic similarity, but not, not to the exact classes. It's kind of uh, the, 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 the layer means that it, uh, it starts by, by looking for small, simple features like edges, spikes, and then it builds up to co more complex features. So it kind of plots together similar images, but not classifies them into classes. And this is what I got. This is a uh, 19th century in Finland. It's all images from 19th century in Finna of physical objects. And, uh, and it's, if you imagine that you would have somebody who had been educated to recognize objects from contemporary pictures, then he would take uh, 20 images of the museum and then pile them up, trying to pile them up, arrange by the similarity, what he thinks is the same object. This is something that, uh, that is the end result. And if you zoom in, uh, you, can, you can see the piles of images and kind of, uh, there are chairs, there are coins and, uh, and, and plates, because they're all round. There are framed uh, pictures, there are clothes, uh, there are vases, and it's uh, it's a, it's a machine vision, machine vision, machine which has been trained on contemporary stock of image, a machine vision on the historical reality. So philosophically, it's kind of interesting. Uh, practically, <laughs> I I don't know. Yeah, yeah, it's not it's not it's not usable to classify. I think, but for me, it was interesting way how you can explore, how you can overview, and just to show there is Estonian, Latvian, and the shape is not, you don't, don't read into shape, because it's, uh, it's basically the piles. It doesn't mean anything that it's uh, like uh, this or that. So this is the, there is a mistake, it's not in Finna, it's with Muis, and you can see how, how they are objects. And this is Latvian data. And also not in Finna, but in NMKK. So, in case uh, any of you are interested to look uh, deeper into those images, I, I'm happy to share them. And also, if you want to generate something, it's, uh, it's also not that complicated. It's uh, doable. I'm not a programmer. I just started learning programming. So, it's not something super, super difficult, but I think it's interesting. So, yeah, contact me if you think you can use some of it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maya. <clears throat> So this is machines' uh, understanding of, of what we have uh, stored in our collections uh, to, to remember about, uh, as, you, as you showed or demonstrated, it's, it's a little bit flawed at the moment. Uh, yeah. The uh, ImageNet, uh, the famous case of uh, how it was proved to be uh, not really that clever was uh, the, the same species of dogs, uh, the huskies were always uh, recognized, they're you know, quite a distinctive species of dogs, easy to recognize for a human, but they were always photographed uh, on the background of snow. <laughs> so 
uh, after a while, the machine started to recognize any dog that was uh, photographed on the snow as a husky uh, species. And I think the cases here with the coins and the plates uh, uh, falling into the same category is, is the same <laughs> type of error that the machine uh, is making. Do you have any, any questions to Maya uh, uh, from the audience here? Uh, Mika has a question and, uh, and there's another one. Thank you very much for this presentation. And uh, I, I, I just want to come back to the question of the storage memory. And uh, it's a database memory. And uh, it, in data, databases have the tendency to split up information. And stories are different. And uh, I, I just wanted to remind of something I said yesterday of the History Helsinki project. It is based on Finna, but on uh, the database there is a narrative layer. And the History Committee of Helsinki has been building this narrative layer. And I think this is a project that should, be, should, should deserve attention. So I, I suggest that you also have a look at it. Regrettably, currently it's only in Finnish and Swedish. Mm -hmm. But but I would like to keep in touch and, and uh, perhaps... Sure, yeah, thank you very much. You yeah, this. I would love to. Yeah, and the language prob problem is... Uh, but you can manage with Google Translate, I've realized. <laughs> and then, then, yeah, yes, yes. Then uh, another thing. Now, uh, you, you mentioned that totalitarian regimes might want to suppress what's in the storage memory. That's not necessarily true, because from the same storage memory you can derive totally opposite stories. I mean, so you can use the same stuff for various and opposite purposes. And this is something challenging, a challenging thing when you try to build a narrative layer, because there are opposing stories and, uh, and uh, I mean, for, from the same, same material. So it depends on how you construct the stories. So I also feel that this, this storytelling uh, needs much more attention. For example, now the History Helsinki project tells one story, but there are completely opposite stories, and, and it depends on what part of society you are. I mean, are you in the center or in the margin, or, or you might be a part of an excluded, excluded minority. For example, the Sami people have had some horrible experiences uh, in, in, in recent history, and now, now there is a Truth and Reconciliation Committee trying to look into this, but I don't know how successful they will be, but I mean, stories are, I mean, they are complex things like this. Mm -hmm. But, but uh, I, museums are there to tell stories, so, so it's a challenge for museums that how will they tell these stories? Do they have one authoritative story? Or are they the, the, the uh, megaphones of the government or, or are they the, the uh, I mean, megaphones of, of the critical intellectuals, of which I'm very critical myself. So, so, so it depends on who, who, who has the right to tell and give a voice to stories. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much for your comment. I think for me, it's actually the positive thing that there can be many stories. And I, I'm um, kind of looking forward that museums will be able to bring as many of them out as possible. So, yeah. But the storage, the storage that keeps all those traces of different pasts is very important to do that. Because if we don't collect, for example, I don't know, Roma's uh, culture, then we can't tell their story. Right. So, was there another question there? Please. Um, thank you for the very interesting research, and I'm really happy that you undertook this task. Um, just one quick clarifying question. I didn't get what was the ultimate size of your data. You say you didn't look at everything, but just a part. And then another for... Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, I did look at the whole, all metadata in NMKK, because I started with that, and then I went uh, down. It was all those... Uh, physical metadata on physical objects and images of physical objects all together it was probably about a million million uh, items wow that's pretty impressive <laughs> so really cool i'll be emailing you okay. and then another question um in the ibero-american um, working group so working with other kinds of museums that don't have such impressive uh, national data sets yet and some of them with much larger uh, 
um, sizes of collections of mostly you know little pieces of uh, excavated materials. Um, the one idea was to use machine learning to support a first um, sort of um, documentation of the collections in which you analyze the photos available and then maybe this is really rough but at least you will identify some um, textiles from um, jo uh, jewelry or from paintings or these kind of things. Would you think, based on your experience, do you think that has any potential? I think yes, because the plot actually... It's not perfect, of course. It just bumps together some some weird stuff, but it still it works on a on a broad level. You get those you get those uh, bunches of stuff, and then you can go in and ex uh, explore them. It, it it won't solve it won't create automatically very like uh, detailed metadata, but it will give you at least narrow down, and then you can go go through with the uh, uh, yeah. So yeah, I think I think it's it works. Yeah. Okay, we also have a question coming from online, that, uh, asking whether you have considered adding metadata, textual metadata, uh, to the images uh, that you have analyzed. So you, you're looking at visual similarities by the image. You could do it on the metadata or or metadata and image combined. There is of course the language issue there. But uh, yeah, I, I kind of I somewhat did that. I think I'm still exploring what to do with this machine view, <laughs> and I, but I think there is a potential that you can afterwards add and look, for example, how how each museum appears in that plot, mm -hmm. or how how various types of museum appears in that plot. Like there are, there are many possibilities, but I'm still in the like still in the process of it. And if you have idea how to, you are please feel free to contact me, I would be happy to hear. Mm -hmm. So what is the prerequisite uh, for joining your, your project or your study? Does the museum system need to have an API for extracting uh, uh, images and, and metadata, or, or did you do it manually? Or <laughs> I, it, it depended actually on each database. In, um, in case of NMKK, I had to ask, request data, and I got 173 Excel sheets, each per, mm -hmm. per each museum one, with different type of columns. So it was really challenging process to put it together. Finnish data has APA, and that's mm -hmm. really perfect when you can pull, like you can work with it. And Moist has an excellent uh, administration, <laughs> which <laughs> helped me uh, a lot and uh, really like prepared data for me. So it's it's a different way, but open data, of course, is. Uh, that's the way to move forward. Mm -hmm. That's easy, easy up things. Okay, and just uh, very quickly, there's also a question uh, about uh, dating of objects, uh, because it's difficult, especially the further back in the history mm -hmm. you go, uh, difficult to date the object or which year they came from. Uh, uh, how did you deal with, uh, with these uh, dates? Do, do you have a principle of assigning a given year, the graph you showed? Um, I basically... Uh, tried to pull out, based on the inf information that was in the database, I tried to make a range for each object. Mm -hmm. I dated this as a range from one year to, to another year. And some objects were arranged for, I don't know, like several centuries, and some were uh, as one year. And then uh, to calculate mnemonic den densities, I actually, it was not, you can't add, for example, all objects from that were dated for these three centuries before Christian era to every year, because then it would seem that we have enormous information on the before Christian era. So I kind of treated each object as having information a value of one, and then subdivided it by the number of years mm -hmm. it's dated to. So that was calculation of... But yeah, I, I think that's the best way how, to, if you consistently want to date object, for my purposes, you need a range from year from year to year. That's kind of works for whatever period you have. Okay, thank you very much.